Is consciousness an emergent phenomenon? What does emergent even mean? Can we fit consciousness into a materialist worldview, or does it necessitate some kind of dualism? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 49th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Good eye, mate. I'm coming to you again from the outback, specifically the city of Sydney, Australia. And we're talking again about a really difficult puzzle that I haven't been able to solve yet. And every time I try to solve it, I end up with a conclusion, or many conclusions, that I don't like. It's the difficult conundrum of consciousness. Man, philosophy would be a lot easier if we didn't have to deal with consciousness. If every single thing that existed was just simply physical with no internal experience or conscious awareness of anything or appearance of free will and self-control and personal identity, if everything was essentially just a little pool ball, ugh, the puzzle would be easily solved and we could move on to other issues. But every time I talk to somebody about consciousness, I keep getting different answers. And I think that's for good reason, because this issue is really stinking difficult. So to help me out, I'm talking this week with Professor David Braddon Mitchell, who is a philosopher at the University of Sydney. We had a really good conversation about some basic questions in the philosophy of mind with a specific focus on this concept of emergence, which we get into in this conversation. And if you're not familiar with emergence, it's essentially the, the orthodox way of explaining the phenomena of consciousness, that consciousness emerges from underlying physical phenomena, whatever emerge means. My wife and I now see an end to this leg of our journey in the East. We've got three, maybe four more countries on our list before we head back home to the States. So whenever that happens, I'm going to go from interviewing all these people in person, and I'm finally going to be able to interview a lot more people on Skype, where I have a reliable internet connection, and I got a big, gigantic, and growing list of people that you guys are suggesting I interview, and I can't wait to get around to doing that. If you've been following the show for a bit and you think it's pretty neat, the work that I've been able to do outside of academia, I've got some good news for you. One, this is just the beginning for me. And two, it can be the beginning for you as well. The world is radically changing, my friends, and your options have just greatly expanded for having a unique, exciting, independent career thanks to the internet. Not only are there lone wolf independent entrepreneurs out there who are working in the world of ideas, there are also companies that are entering into this space, namely the company that is sponsoring this episode, Praxis. The folks over at Praxis also realize that the world has already changed. They see that what employers require is not a degree, a certificate from their potential employees to say, oh, now they're certified to go create value for them. No, what employers need right now in the real world is competent, enthusiastic young people, irrespective of their formal training. So Praxis is filling a gigantic hole in the market. All of those people that want to get good, exciting jobs, they want to be part of the world of entrepreneurship, but they don't want to shell out $80,000 or $100,000 to spend four years of their life wasting away in the academy. They take individuals like that and give them three months of a professional boot camp that's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship in the real world at a startup where they can start creating value immediately. So check them out, steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. Get some more information. You could even schedule a call with them to see if the program is right for you. So let's get to my conversation with Dr. Brad and Mitchell of the University of Sydney, where he teaches philosophy. He's also written a book called Philosophy of Mind and Cognition, as well as co-authoring a book with a previous guest on the show, Robert Nola. The book that they edited together is called Conceptual Analysis and Philosophical Naturalism. So I think you guys are really going to love this conversation with Dr. Brad and Mitchell. So first of all, thanks very much for sitting down talking with me today. I appreciate it. Pleasure. I need your help. Yeah. Because I have asked quite a lot of people about fundamental ideas in the philosophy of mind, and I've made virtually no progress. Ask it somebody different, you get a different answer. 
So I've got a few basic questions for you, um, all having to do with consciousness. What is consciousness? What is the mind? And hopefully we'll get to a little bit into intentionality and specifically one concept that I want to talk to you about, this idea of emergence. This is the term that gets thrown around. So let's start with a basic question. What is your conception of what the mind is from a metaphysical standpoint? And why is it so hard for us to wrap our own minds around what the mind is? I think they're both two very good questions. I think the second question is actually almost as important as the first question. Because I'm going to give you a deflationary, simple answer to the first question. But then that's going to leave the second question hanging there. Because if the basic deflationary story I'm going to tell you is right, how come it's not obviously right? How come people find it so unsatisfying? So perhaps I should start with the, the basic simple answer to the first question. Uh, minds are complicated systems that respond to the world. They're kind of biochemical maps of the way the world is, engineered by evolution to try and change the world in various ways. They're devices that respond to their environment um, so as to cause things to happen in an organism which then change the environment in a certain way. Okay. They're complicated maps of how things are and that they're geared to make changes in the world. That's what minds are. Okay. But <laughs> you're going to say that somehow seems very unsatisfactory and we have to have some answer about why it's unsatisfactory, why yeah. it seems unsatisfactory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I like that from an outside perspective. If I could say, oh, what are minds and creatures and animals? I find that very satisfying. Then I think about myself and I think, well, that's not what's going on. I have this experiential phenomenon. I'm aware of things. That doesn't seem to be captured by the idea of think of it as a map, like as an objective thing out there. I'm, I'm experiencing it from the inside, whatever that means. Yeah. So some story's got to be given about why everyone, including myself on every second Tuesday and most of my undergraduate students and you, have got this sense that there's something unsatisfactory about that kind of answer. Yeah. There's a lot of ways one could perceive. One of them is like this. This, I think, is part of the illusion about the unsatisfactoriness of that answer. Sometimes you say to someone, look, I'll tell you what a mind is. I gave you what's called a functional definition of a mind, but I, I describe the mind in terms of what it does and says anything that does that is a mind. Okay. But it follows that some of the things that do those things are physical objects like our brains and our bodies. And so our minds, on my view, then are our brains and our bodies. Now, you say that to someone, I say it to you, and you think, yeah, but... Somehow, from the inside, that doesn't seem right. 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 Somehow, it doesn't seem right that I'm just a, just say, for example, a brain, to keep it simple. Although right. I think the brain and the body are intera interacting in important ways, and it's the whole system that is the mind. Why doesn't it seem so? Here's one reason I think it doesn't seem satisfactory. It's an illusion caused by doing some false comparison. Okay. Firstly, you think about a brain. And you close your eyes and you imagine neurons firing and you imagine a neuroanatomy textbook mm -hmm. and you think, okay, that's one kind of thing. And then you stop imagining a brain and you start imagining your own thoughts and you start imagining the feeling you have when you listen to Beethoven's Opus 111 Piano Sonata and you're all carried away in those wonderful moments in the second movement or you know, whatever it is that carries you away. And you think those things just seem radically different. Yeah. You're imagining this outside thing that seems like it's goopy and squishy, and then you're imagining this inside thing. But of course, that's a mistake, because what you're actually doing is comparing two very different brain states. So all you can compare is brain states. You are a brain state, right? So you're comparing the brain state of thinking about brains with the brain state about th of thinking about music and the brain state of thinking about brains and the brain state of thinking about music are extraordinarily different brain states. Okay. So, of course, they seem different. Okay. Well, that's my first take on what explains the kind of illusion. So, okay. think of it this way. Okay. I, I look down a microscope and I, and I look at cells and I have brain state A. And then brain state B, I close my eyes and I, you know, smell perfume. Okay. Yeah, totally different experiences because totally different brain states. Okay. There seems something that still seems unsatisfactory in this way. There's something about thinking about an experience, which would be a particular brain state when we're thinking about the experience of something, but that seems different than actually experiencing that thing. So it's different to say I'm thinking about the experience of 
experiencing red and thinking about how that would be. But it's another thing to be in the experience itself. My same story will apply to that case too. You've got these two brain states. Brain state A, all you're doing is concentrating on redness. Brain state B, you're concentrating on redness and part of your brain is also thinking about redness. Tremendously different brain states. <laughs> Not surprising that they're going to seem very different to you. Okay, so is there any factor of the personal perspective that comes into this? So when I'm thinking about different brain states, it seems like there is still some kind of a, there's some kind of a boundary between your experience or your conscious goings on and mine. That still seems maybe not captured. It almost seems like if, we, if you and I were to think of the same thing that we would be having the same like, perspective on something. Does that, that, that seems like, well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't quite follow. It seems to me that the, the, what I'm calling the simple picture I've told mm -hmm. you um, is one which actually crucially captures the idea that we each have an utterly individual perspective on things. Mm. Because what each of us is, is a system located at a certain point in space and located at a certain place in time who when they respond to the world, can only make interventions in a certain way. Um, when I have thoughts, I can only move my own arms, I can only make my own words happen, I can't make your arms move except by very, very indirect methods. So we're each of us located in space and time very, very differently. Mm. Um, and that's what, that's what constrains, I guess, in my view, mm. this, this, kind of, this kind of individuality. Okay, so would you say that, that our perspectives, so when I'm talking about like my perspective right now, the phenomena that I'm experiencing in my consciousness, that is the exact same thing, identical to the brain state that this, well, I'm pointing, but the listeners can't see, that the goings-on in my head is in, identical. That's right. That's the view. Okay. And I'll tell you what I think about emergence later, if you want. Okay. <laughs> what the relationship is between those claims. Okay, so before we get to that, yeah. that, to me, that says something really remarkable about what we usually consider as physical objects and physical stuff. That implies that, you know, the, the phone that's here on the table and the, the paper and the boxes, all of this stuff is constituted by some some substratum that if you fold it over just right, it gets this subjective experience going on that I'm, that, that is happening. Isn't that some kind of like a, some version of like a proto-panpsychism maybe as it's called? Right, there's two ways of thinking about this and one is going to lead you quite quickly into some sort of panpsychism. It's the idea that what you have is um, features of the physical world which have somehow or other got a mysterious power, which it, such that when you combine those things with those power in the right way, you get consciousness. Yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that because on the story I want to tell, what consciousness is, is the things doing the ordinary things that they do when they're organized in a way that enables them to do the ordinary things that they do. So it doesn't require on the picture I'm painting them, which is a, I guess a relatively orthodox physicalist picture, it doesn't require there to be anything special about the constituents of the thing mm. over and above what it takes to contribute to it, it functioning in the world in the way that it does function. So there's no extra kind of magic source that, you know, even the, even the atoms of, of my spectacles and even the bits of this paper have. There's various reasons why I think that the magic source story doesn't really work. I mean, one of them is this. It's that a protopanpsychist is someone who thinks that um, it's not true that the atoms of my phone are conscious but they've got this special power such that when you combine them in the right way, yeah. you get consciousness. Right. But the regular physicalist who's not a, um, a protopanpsychist already has the problem of how do you get things which definitely aren't conscious in any way, not even protoconscious, namely the, the atoms and molecules that make up my brain. Yeah. In virtue of what do they get to count as conscious? And the ordinary physicalist says, well, in virtue of their organization and in virtue of what it is they do in the world. Because the functionalist physicalist is someone who says that um, what minds are is uh, physical systems that are minds in virtue of what they do, not what they're made of. Now, the protopanpsychist has introduced this extra magic source, 
but they've got exactly the same problem of how to get from these proto-pan psychic things, which by definition aren't themselves. They're only proto-conscious, right? Okay. They're not conscious in any way. <laughs> they've got to say something about how it's all organized and how it's all put together and how yeah. organizing and puts together creates consciousness. And that looks like exactly the same problem that the ordinary physicalist has. So it looks like they've added nothing to the solution. From my perspective, at least in the way that was formulated, it seems like those are actually kind of the same position, though. Right, because isn't that actually what the the physicalist would be saying? Is just the only the only difference is that we say it's not magic sauce; it's just physical. The physicalist says it doesn't matter yeah. what that what the what the underlying substratum is, right. so long as it can do these things. Right. The proto panpsychist says it does matter. There's some special feature it has to have. Oh. So it's not enough just to be able to do the normal causal stuff. It's got to have this extra feature X, which is the proto. Uh, conscious feature okay. and it's only when you put proto-conscious things together in a way you get full-blown consciousness so I the see. regular physicalist says put together anything in the right way so that it does these things you'll get consciousness the proto-panpsychist says oh no if you put the wrong things together you'll have something that looks like it's conscious but isn't conscious because it's not made out of the proto-panpsychological stuff I see but there still seems to be a very uh, fundamental agreement in the sense that whatever whatever the underlying stuff is it is still, you form it in such a way and you get what we call consciousness. That's right. That's the agreement. Right. Okay. And so, the, so it, the agreement is there in as much as both the, the physicalist thinks that both the physicalist and the protopanpsychist faces the same problem. But the protopanpsychist introduces something extra, which is supposed to help solve the problem, which doesn't help solve the problem. <laughs> and so the physicalist says, that's one that victory for me. So far. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't say I've solved the problem, but right. that you guys, your extra thing is not helping. Okay, so this is a natural segue maybe to one physicalist explanation for conscious phenomena, which is that it's emergent. So just help me understand what does it mean to say, just in the standard orthodoxy, that consciousness is an emergent phenomena? I hope that the standard orthodoxy would be that emergence doesn't make sense, <laughs> and therefore I can't say that. Okay. But then maybe that's not standard orthodoxy, but let me tell you, tell you, tell you why, why I think that anyway. <laughs> so emergence is often, depends what you mean by emergence. Okay. The problem is that so many people say so many different things yes. about, about emergence. So one way of understanding what emergence is supposed to be is emergence is supposed to be a halfway house. A halfway house between kind of reductionism, which says that all there really is, in some sense of really is, is whatever there's there fundamentally, and a kind of dualism, which mm -hmm. says, look, there's this stuff here that's that's fundamental, and in addition, there's other stuff which is entirely ontologically distinct. Mm -hmm. And the emergentist is supposed to be some kind of halfway house between, between mm -hmm. the two of them, right? It sort of seems like this fundamental stuff, but then there's other stuff, and it's sort of genuinely novel. It's genuinely novel, but it's not new. It's sort of novel, but not new. It's kind of new, but not new. The, uh, it's, it's not the same as the fundamental stuff. It's not like dualism, that bad view, which says right, there's this right. extra stuff which is totally distinct. Right. <laughs> you could probably see from the way I'm uh, unfairly caricaturing yes. it, the sort of general, general line I'll, I want to say about it. So the way I think of it is this. Um, what does it mean to say something's novel? That's a really interesting question. It's a hard question. What does it make something distinct? Right. I've got a whole bunch of particles arranged in a certain way, and there's a triangle as well, say, because they're arranged triangle-wise. Mm. What would it be to say that the triangle is genuinely ontically distinct mm -hmm. from the constituents that make it up? Right. Um, that's actually I think, one of the really hard questions in philosophy. And the answer which I'm attracted to is an argument, uh, an answer that depends on logical entailment. The story is this. If being arranged the way they are just logically entails as a triangle, although we might have different language to talk about triangles and the particles arranged that way, in the world it's just the one thing. Because if you're arranged that way, it's just a fact of logic that you have a triangle as well. Hmm. So no, no ontological distinctness. So conceptual distinction, distinctness perhaps, but not ontological distinctness. So the triangles and the particles arranged triangle-wise are the very same thing. So let me just ask you yeah. one question to clarify that. Are you saying that, ontologically speaking, there really is no triangle? Or that's a conceptual not, thing not, that we're bringing to the table? No, I'm not saying that. No. I'm saying, sure, there's a triangle. And sure, there are particles arranged triangle-wise, and there are different ways of talking about the same reality. So 
but then don't you run into a, the trouble of at what point do the particles then become the triangle? Don't you run it like if you were to add one bit at a time, would you have a new thing come into existence? Well, if you added one bit at a time, of course you've got a new thing coming into existence because you've added a bit. Okay, now that's the part that you've got to help me out because this is where I get hung up on emergence a lot. Yeah. This idea of, a, of something coming into existence that wasn't and then coming out of existence. So if, you, if we're arranging the triangle, we add bit by bit, and then there's the new thing, and then we take off one bit when it goes away. I think the way I think of it is there's the underlying reality, and then there's the right way to talk about the underlying reality. Mm. Okay. So I've got a bunch of particles arranged in a certain way, and if they're arranged in a, a certain way, it's, you might be fine to talk about them as, as um, a bunch of particles. Mm -hmm. They might not be fine to talk about them as a triangle because you know, there's, there's a gap somewhere. Mm -hmm. Add another particle. Now, I've obviously got a different fundamental reality now because it's got an extra particle in it, right? So something has changed in the world. Okay. But in addition, something else has changed, which is this new fundamental reality. It's still cool to talk about it as particles arranged a certain way, but it's now cool to talk about it as a triangle. But it's not like there's only particles and no triangle. Or it's not like there is a triangle and it depends on the particles. There's just the one thing there which it's right to describe in these two ways. A moment ago, there was a different thing there. And it was only okay to talk about that thing in terms of particles being arranged a certain way because it wasn't arranged the right way for it to be also right to okay. talk, use triangle language. So what if I were to take this route and I were to say it would be incorrect to say prior to that last particle yeah. bringing the triangle into existence. It would be incorrect to say that there is one thing there and then there's a new thing there after you add the particle. Really, the only thing that's there, it's just the particles. And our minds are the things that create boundaries over when we say, oh, this is a triangle, that's not a triangle. Ah, okay. Yeah. So now we're leading into something outside of philosophy of mind, and we're leading into, I suppose, uh, some sort of myriology. Um, myriology is the theory of parts and holes and, mm. and stuff like that. Mm. So, so what you might think, some people do think, is all there are is the simples. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, there's, there are no extra things, as it were, made up out of the simples. Um, that's kind of myriological nihilism. It's the view that you know, all there is is whatever is fundamental and simple and indivisible. Mm -hmm. um, there's another view which says that when you combine the simple things, you get holes. But not every combination of simple things generates a hole. And there's a third view called myriological universalism, which says, look, there are the simple things, and then every possible way of combining them is another thing. Wow, it's a lot of things. It's a lot of things, but the, but the universalist mm -hmm. normally says, but these things are cheap. They're not really <laughs> ontologically distinct from the underlying mass of, 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 of components. Okay. Right? So they just, so one way of being a myriological universalist is to say, look, there are as, there as many things as there are ways of combining all the fundamental things, but that's just ways of talking about arrangements of the fundamental things. It's not like you're really adding stuff to the world. But if it's just a, a, a ways of talking, then that would seem like it is still kind of the myological nihilist position where it's... That's why yeah. I, I'm certainly of the view that myriological universalism in this deflationary way yeah. and myriological nihilism actually really agree about ontology. Really? They disagree about ideology. Okay. They disagree about the right way to use language. I, I'm probably in that category. I'm either a myriological nihilist or a deflationary universalist. Okay. This seems like it has direct um, correlation to when we're talking about the mind, especially yeah. when we're talking about if, if there's this correspondence between the assemblance of bits of matter which create a brain and the mind if there's some new thing that, that comes into existence, which I would like to return just to that question. If we could get an orthodox, even if incorrect, mm. or the, the standard way that people talk about, oh, consciousness is an emergent Okay, phenomenon. I hadn't actually yeah. finished saying what I was going to say. Oh, yes, I interrupted you. Yeah, that's, that's all right. <laughs> so I was trying to come up with an account of distinctness, and what I was suggesting was that the best account of distinctness is that distinctness should be understood as... Uh, something is not distinct if being, a, being one way logically entails being another way. These aren't distinct ways of being. Um, in which case, to be distinct would be for that logical entailment to fail. So in other words, if being arranged in a certain way physically fails to logically entail being in a certain way mentally, then being in a certain way mentally is distinct from being in a certain way physically. So one way of understanding what emergence would be in which emergence is concerned with genuine novelty, right? bringing about something as genuinely new, mm -hmm. is that some state might be emergent provided um, being the way it is fundamentally doesn't logically entail being the way it is emergently. Mm. 
But if that's how you understand emergence, emergence just is a brand of good old fashioned dualism. Because good old fashioned dualism is the view that, you know, there's some property that you have, which is logically distinct from how things are. Mm -hmm. There's a possible world where they, where things are physically the first way, but the mental fails to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think that trying to come up with a story about um, uh, emergence, which is a genuinely ontological story about emergence, either fails or turns into dualism. Now, there's another kind of emergence. Scientists often talk about emergen em emergence, which mm -hmm. I think is entirely harmless, but it's fundamentally not really ontological. It's, you might call it epistemological emergence. Mm -hmm. You might say, look, being a certain way entails incredibly complicated stuff that's hard to understand. It's much easier to think about them in, in a certain more abstract way. Um, often it, you do better science when you don't concern yourself with the minute, minute details, but deal with abstractions over mm -hmm, the things. Mm -hmm. And that's what people often sometimes in those contexts mean by emergence. So I think you get in this literature, you get this incredible confusion of people using emergent in these different sorts of ways. So for example, um, people often talk about chaos theory as being a theory about emergence. And in one sense, emergence, it, it's perfectly good, right? What it means is, look, there's, um, there, are, mm -hmm. there are fundamental bits of the universe. They're moving according to, to, to simple deterministic laws governed by dynamic, dynamic equations. Um, doing the math to figure out how things are going to behave based on those dynamic equations and based on how things are fundamentally is so complicated, it's essentially impossible. And it requires infinite precision in your measurements of initial states, doing calculations, it's entirely useless. You're much better off using meteorology. Mm -hmm. Or you're much better off using rules of thumb about how the macroscopic systems work. Right. Or you're much better off using mathematical theories about these, how these systems work. That's all absolutely true. But that doesn't tell you that as a matter of ontology, right. there's anything more than the, the fundamental stuff. So would you say it's a fair criticism of this idea of, of this halfway house? That the, the claim as it's usually repeated is something like, okay, you have the fundamental bits of matter and then you arrange them in a particular way and then you get this new thing that emerges. But if it is genuinely an ontologically new thing, that seems to be the definition of dualism. That's right. And if it's not distinct, then it's more of a linguistic thing that we're just calling it something new. That's my picture. Yeah. Okay. So... That's also my picture, but you and I are in different camps because I'm forced into the dualist position and I don't like it. I call myself a reluctant dualist because there's these features that, you know, I think about physical phenomena, I think of mental phenomena, I think, gosh, these things seem <laughs> so hard to yeah, reconcile. Yeah, actually, I think you and I are not on such a similar camp as you might think. I mean, we have, oh. dif we have, different, we have different conclusions, right? You're, right. You're, you're, you're driven to dualism, but I think you're right to be driven to dualism. <laughs> it seems to me that the big intellectual mistake people make is thinking that they can thinking they can have this appearance of novelty w without dualism. Okay. And if you really think that if, if accepting that conscious states are genuinely novel, yeah. I think requires you in consistency to go to dualism. So, okay, well, I'm open, though, open and And I also eager. accept, by the way, that it's the, it's the big counterintuitive pill you have to bite about physicalism to deny that genuine novelty. Okay, but I'm ready. I mean, the pill's there. I talk to a lot of people who say that it's a compelling, coherent worldview, this physicalism. So can you help me, can you help persuade me into this camp that when I, cause when I conceive of physical phenomena, maybe this is the, an incorrect way of conceiving of physical phenomena, when I think of bits of matter, fundamental bits of matter, the way that I'm conceiving of them is that there is no consciousness or potential for consciousness there. It's just uh, consciousless. <laughs> That's not a word, but <laughs> it is a conscious. And yet, if that's a correct way of thinking about physical phenomena, then you're, I think you're forced into this camp of there's something else going on, unless we take what I, it seems to be the panpsychist approach is to say, okay, well, when you conceive of the fundamental constituents of the universe, you must, you must have a little addendum that says, but if they're arranged in the, in the right way, you get this completely what seems to be categorically different phenomena than just being spatially extended and being bumped around, you get first-person subjective experience. Okay, so I guess I don't think that. I mean, here's, here's why, here's just an intuitive story about how you might psychologically resist it. It's more kind of therapy than argument, right? <laughs> it goes something like this is, look, the picture, the picture I was, the simple picture I called it at the beginning. Everyone always calls their own picture the simple picture. Right. So, yeah. um, 
a simple picture is one where what consciousness is is a certain kind of doing. It's consciousness is an activity. Consciousness is um, stuff that does something in a certain context. Okay. And doings are very impressive things. You know, a star is a very impressive thing. If you saw a whole bunch of hydrogen, you might find yourself thinking, "I've got some hydrogen here." You know, man, you know that's a star. But someone telling me all that star is is just hydrogen. <laughs> but when when the hydrogen does some pretty impressive stuff, it's pretty impressive, and. The doing that is consciousness on my story mm -hmm. is this doing where massively complicated maps of the way the world is, the way the world is outside gets encoded in a complicated physical system that then goes and changes the world. It has the, this, this complicated physical system has an encoding of both how the world is and another encoding of how the world could be, and it tries to change the world to make the world actually more like the way it could be than like it is. That's an impressive bunch of doings, and the way that a star is an impressive bunch of doing. doesn't surprise me that you would think that it would be really odd to think that a bunch of hydrogen in a balloon, right, could be a star right. in the same way a bunch of oxygen and stuff. Okay. How could it be a mind? Two questions on that. Yeah. One, I, I like the analogy with the, the hydrogen and the star, but I have no difficulty conceiving of amazing physical phenomena taking place because they, it seems like a qualitative difference between... The physical goings on in a star, which is you know lots of explosion and light and and stuff going on, but that seems to be in a different, at least in my conceptual framework, mm. that seems to be in a different category of experiential phenomena. You don't get qualia in a star, but here you do get qualia. So maybe that, that was more of a statement than a question. The question that I have for you is, do you think then it's inconceivable to think of the philosophical zombie, the, the, the bit of the, the assortment of the universe which, let's say, looks like me, well, from your perspective, looks like me, acts like me, behaves like me, but doesn't have this qualitative internal experience. Do you think that's inconceivable? I have a very complicated story about the philosophical zombie. Okay. Um, <laughs> my story is, strictly speaking, it's inconceivable but that we give it a not, but we ought rationally give a non-zero credence to it being conceivable. And anything which you think might be conceivable is in some sense impossible to distinguish between something which is conceivable. And that's, I don't know who's listening to you out there in <laughs> YouTube world. I'm sure that made absolutely no sense to you. Let me try and say it again. Here's my story about how it can be both inconceivable but seem that as though it is conceivable. Okay. So I agree, it seems that it's inconceivable, right? It seems that I can imagine a, uh, a world which contains a physical duplicate of me and simply it has no, no consciousness. Right. Still the goings-on, but just not that goings-on. That's goings right. On. Well, all the goings-on, but, no, but, but without the consciousness. It seems as though that's conceivable, in some sense conceivable. Um, for those of you who are listening to this, you don't know what, why we're talking about zombies, it's... <laughs> For the, for the following reason, there's an argument that goes like this. It's conceivable there could be something, perhaps not in this possible world, because maybe there are natural laws that make it so, but in some other possible world, that is an exact physical duplicate of us, but lacks consciousness. doesn't look like I made a conceptual error when I'm thinking that. But if it's, if it's conceivable, then what some people would think is that conceivability is a guide to what's possible. In which case, it's possible that there's an entity which is physically exactly like us and lacks all consciousness. But if what consciousness just is is being exactly like us, physically, then it's, of course it's impossible there could be something that's exactly like us and lacks consciousness. So if we have an argument from it being conceivable to its being possible, then we've shown that physicalism is false because physicalism is the view that what consciousness is is being physically like us. It's, a lot, it's guaranteed. So you're essentially that's, just denying the, the idea of the distinction between the conscious goings-on and the physical going-on. I haven't got to that yet. All I do is outlining why, why anyone would care about that argument, right? That was, okay. So, okay. so I was just giving you the dualist argument, right? Okay. The your argument, <laughs> <laughs> right? which says that dualism is true because we can conceive of beings that are physically, physically different from us without consciousness, and therefore it's possible. And if it's possible, then dualism must be true and physicalism must be false. So typically, physicalists are put in the position where they have to say one of a couple of things. Either it's inconceivable, 
and some kind of illusion of conceivability, or else it's conceivable, but conceivability is not a good guide to possibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, my guess is that most physicalists, in fact, take that second route. They say, look, yeah, yeah, lots of rubbish is conceivable, it's not possible. I have a different story. My story is something like this. The simple story I gave you at the beginning turns out to be a little bit too simple. <laughs> the simple story I gave you at the beginning was that, as it were, by definition, what consciousness is, is being physically organized in a certain way, functioning in a certain way. And if that's true by definition, a priori, as most so-called a priori physicalists think, then it just follows from that claim that it's impossible that something can be physically organized that way without being conscious, right? Mm -hmm. Because a priori, it's, if you're organized that way, then you're conscious. So it's impossible. So if it's conceivable, then either conceivability is no good guide to possibility or it's an illusion, it's not conceivable. Mm -hmm. My view is that it's not a priori that things are conscious if they're organized a certain way. Something much more complicated is, is a priori. Yeah. And the more complicated thing is this. It's if there is, as a matter of fact, in the actual world, dualistic stuff, if dualism is, as a matter of empirical fact, true about the world, then dualism is a necessary claim. Dualism is, if true, a necessary truth. So if there is dualistic stuff in the world, you have to have dualistic stuff in order to have consciousness. But if there's no dualistic stuff in the actual world, then this functional thing is true, that what consciousness is is just being organized in a certain way. So my claim is all that's a priori is this conditional claim mm -hmm. okay. that you know, if dualism is true as a matter of fact, it's a necessary truth. Okay. And if it's not, then this functional story is true. And the reason, one of the reasons I think this conditionally story is true is that it seems to me there's no discovery we could make about the world which would make us deny our own consciousness. If I, if, if I discover tomorrow that dualism is true, I'm going to say, great, I must have dualistic stuff. But having decided that, having decided therefore dualism is a necessary truth and you have to have dualistic stuff in order to have a mind, if I then discover the day after that, that actually just been proved in nature, no dualistic stuff, the world only contains physical things, I'm not going to go, dang, I'm not conscious. <laughs> right. Right? I'm going to say, oh, right, in that case, something else must be conscious. It must be the stuff that we've got because one thing I'm sure of is that I'm conscious. Right? Right. So that's why I think this conditional has to be true. Now, the conditional starts off with if there is dualistic stuff in the world. And that's like, is it an empirical claim? It's something close to an empirical claim. It's a claim about what the world contains. Mm -hmm. And as it's a claim about what the world contains, it's not something I can know a priori. It depends on what you mean by a priori. Well, right? yeah, it does. Like, look, I can, I can have reasons to believe it's false, <laughs> but I can't have an a priori. Okay, uh, you have to experience consciousness in, in order to know the answer of what it is. I wasn't going to say that. I was, yeah, I was going to say something like, I, I, I can't, if I'm a physicalist, yeah. I can't be certain that physicalism is true. Right. Because this is, a, this is a kind of a contingent claim that the world contains. So as a physicalist, I'm claiming contingently the world doesn't contain this dualistic stuff. Mm -hmm. Since it's contingent, if I'm a rational being, I have to give some credence to the world actually containing some, some dualistic stuff. And if the story I gave you was true, the complicated story, if the world does contain some dualistic stuff, then dualism is true and necessarily true. So what that means is, if I'm a physicalist and I'm rational, I have to give some credence to being wrong. Because, you know, I'm a good Bayesian. I think that I shouldn't <laughs> give a credence of zero to anything. So I'll give a credence of, you know, 0 0.05 to dualism being true. Right? So I think there's a 1 in 20 chance the world contains, contains dualistic stuff. But according to my own theory, I mean, I'm still a physicalist, right? I think that there's you know, 19 in 20 chance that it doesn't contain any dualistic stuff. But that means that I'm giving a 1 in 20 chance to the world containing dualistic stuff. And in virtue of that conditional thing I told you before, it follows that I'm giving a 1 in 20 chance to dualism being true and necessarily true. But if dualism is true and necessarily true, then zombies are possible. So as a physicalist, I have to give a 1 in 20 chance mm. to zombies being possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually think they're impossible. <laughs> I, I give a 19 in 20 chance to them being impossible. Okay. But so long as I think there's some reasonable chance that they're, they're possible, then I'm going to kind of think they're conceivable. Okay. Because I'm conceiving of them being possible, even though I think they're impossible. So it's one okay. of those cases of hyper-intentional conceivability, right? There are lots of things which, as a matter of fact, are impossible, 
but which nonetheless, you know, as rational beings, we think, well, you know, that theorem might not be a theorem after all. Maybe it is possible, even though I think on balance it's not. So that's why I think it's conceivable. That's why I think we can kind mm -hmm. of conceive of zombies. It's because to the extent that we're rational, we think that we might be wrong about our physicalism. If we're wrong about our physicalism, then dualism is true. If dualism is true, zombies are possible. So I, I can, you know, in some, there's got to be some sense of conceivability in which you can conceive of things that are impossible and despite that you think are on balance impossible, even though you think there's some chance they really are possible. Does that not imply, though, that you're making at least a clear conceptual distinction between physical phenomena and what we consider to be conscious goings on? That's a good question. Uh, I don't think so, because I'm making a clear distinction between physical phenomena and non-physical phenomena. Mm. and then leaving it open whether consciousness is amongst the non-physical phenomena. So let's say we're talking specifically about the philosophical zombies and what they lack is not the non-physical phenomena, but specifically consciousness, yep. like the qualitative, yep. the qualia stuff. So in that sense, wouldn't that still mean then there is still a clear conceptual distinction between physical goings-on and qualia happening? Remember how this messy picture goes. According to the messy picture, if there is no non-physical stuff in the actual world, then what qualia are are just these organisations of mm. physical stuff. I see, I see, I see. In which case, if that's how the actual world is, mm. then the possible world in which there's a physical copy, of course, contains a mental copy. Okay, so you're saying that the qualia, it's an open question as to whether or not the qualia are physical or non-physical, right. but you're not denying the existence of qualia. That's right. I that's see. Right. So that's, in, that's very interesting. And it also accepts the conceptual priority of dualism, right? Because notice I said something like, if there is any dualistic stuff in the world, then that's what consciousness is. Hmm. It's just that I think, as a matter of fact, there are all these good reasons for believing it's not there, in which case we have to accept this second best story, which so is... It, it sounds like, though, if you make that conceptual distinction between the qualia and the physical phenomena... It sounds like this position is something like a dualistic physicalism in the sense that we're granting radically different goings-on in the world. We're just not willing to grant the non-spatiality of it, of the one. No, it's granting, it's only granting the, the goings-on of radically different things under certain assumptions. So what it really is, is I think it's a common thing in philosophy. It's a case where we've got a broad concept and then we've got these ideas about what it takes to have it, and then we've got a suspicion that we haven't really got that special thing, and the kind of a second best story. So let me give you another example um, outside of philosophy of mind. Uh, let's think about free will, right? So a lot of people argue about whether free will requires the special, amazing power to kind of intervene in the future and make it one way rather than another in a way which is not governed by the way things were in the past. And some people think that what it takes to have free will is to have that, and if you don't have that, you haven't got free will. Mm -hmm. And other people think that there could be some really deflationary story. Free will is just what happens when your brain behaves normally and no one's pointing a gun at your head, right? This is the, call that the, mm -hmm. the, second, the second best mm -hmm. account. You might just think they're not about the same topic at all. But what I actually think about this kind of case is that, look, this first case has some kind of priority. If we really do have this mysterious power to change the future in a way utterly unconstrained by the past and impose our will on the world in a way which is not just governed by the physical laws. If any of us or most of us have that power, gee, wow, that's cool. That's what free will is. Yeah. It's what we always wanted, right? right? But if we don't have that, should we say there's no free will? Hell no. This is the second best thing. And that, that, that will do in the absence of this thing which we've been pre-programmed by whatever it is our psychology and our background think is, the, is the, 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 what David Lewis once called the best deserver mm -hmm. right, of what free will is. And I suppose I think that about what's right about dualism, it seems to me, is that dualism is the best observer of the name of consciousness. Yes, we are pre-programmed to think all the things that dualists think and that I think every third Tuesday when I flirt with dualism. Um, and if there were stuff in the world that was not part of the physical world as we currently understand it and which was responsible for my experience, or which is my experience, whatever other criteria... Uh, required to, if there were things in the world like that, sure, that would be the best observer of what consciousness is. Okay. But if it's not there, and you know, there'll be various reasons to think it might not be there, then here's the second best thing. 
the, the functionalist picture. And I think that it's a conceptual truth that that second best picture will do. And I think it's a conceptual truth because the dualists I've known who've become converted to physicalism haven't done what they ought to do if they were consistent to begin with, said, oh, I become converted to physicalism, so damn, I'm not conscious. <laughs> That's not what they say. <laughs> so everyone, everyone, everyone who's a physicalist who gets converted to dualism always seems to think, oh, now I'm converted to dualism. I now see that the dualistic stuff is the conscious stuff. Yeah. And the dualists who get converted to physicalism don't say there's no consciousness. They, they say, oh, now I see that, you know, that there's only physical stuff, but that's okay. It, it'll still do. And that's so coherent and so consistent, I think it tells you something about the nature of the concept of experience. Yes, it seems like this, and this is what I think is the case, that the, the qualitative, the qualia, the phenomena that we experience is, is the indubitable stuff. And then we try to give it an expl. We try to explain its existence. And if you wind up with a theory that eliminates its existence, it says you're not conscious. Well, I think that's actually a demonstration of the the inaccuracy of the theory because we just can't get rid of the qualia. It seems. But so let me ask you, because um, again, I'm I'm a I'm I want to be a physicalist. I want to be a monist. And I don't want to be an idealist. So I could push the easy solution for that. Yeah. that pushes yeah. me in the other direction. Um, so about the qualia. So we acknowledge qualia is a phenomena that is happening in the universe. Yeah. Okay. So when I so you've got a red book over there, and if I'm aware of the phenomena that I'm experiencing, there is the experience of red. That experience itself, as I'm referencing it, is something which is spatially extended. That it is it is identical to matter. How, how can I understand that? Because the, I, I, I can say that. I say, well, that, okay, that would explain it. But I don't find that persuasive. And all the physical stuff I have ever seen, and if anybody's investigated, it's, n- it's not qualitative. It's not, it's not. Yeah, it is. Your brain is qualitative. People might have investigated your brain. But when they investigate my brain, they're not investigating the actual phenomenological experience that's going on. They might be. They've, they've messed with you. I mean, people have given you pills that probably changed your actual phenomenological experience. Yes, but even if you were to dissect, if you... It, no, okay. look, I, I know what you mean. I'm, 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 okay, well, let me, let me ask for my, um, yeah. for my listeners. Mm. So if you were to take apart every single bit of atom, a bit of atom, every single bit of matter in my brain, every single part, down to the fundamental, you know, quarks of the universe, Planck units of the universe, all of it, it does not seem to me that you would find the experiencing of red in there anywhere. This actually takes me right back to how we began this discussion a little hour ago, and I gave you my little example, right, of looking at the microscope and looking at neurons on the one hand and closing your eyes but thinking your own experience on the other hand. When you talk about going into the universe and dividing it up into quarks and so on, what you're doing, because you only ever have your own experience... You never, you don't have someone else's experience because you, you are identical with this, this physical thing. All you ever have is the experiences of this physical thing. And the experience that, I'm pointing at my own head, by the way, listeners. <laughs> um, and the experience of this physical thing, the experience this physical thing has when it investigates quarks and it tears physical things apart and so mm-hmm. forth is a different experience from the experience it has when it just closes its eyes and thinks about itself. So, of course, those things will always seem tremendously different. But, but isn't, there, there's something on it, I can't put my finger exactly on it, but there's something about that that seems to deny the, this difference between the, the outside and the inside. So it's like, the, at least my conception of what is physical, maybe this is the trouble is I'm not a physicalism mm. because I don't have a broad enough conception of what is physical, but it doesn't seem like there's any inside to external phenomena. Like, you, you know, the, the, the atoms or the, the space-time units, whatever they are, there's no internal going on. There's no perspective, it seems. Yeah. Well, there's all kinds of things that they might or might not have intrinsically, which all, all we ever know about the world outside our own mind is how it affects us. We've got no clue what things outside our own mind are like in themselves. There's a doctrine, I think the second time I mentioned David Lewis, my big, this is... A, Interesting philosophical conversation where you mentioned the names of almost no philosophers, um, <laughs> except one guy, and I've mentioned his name twice. Um, there's a view he called um, 
Ramsian humility, um, and the Ray Langton has called well, Kantian humility, but that's a totally, totally different view. But Ramsian humility is this idea that we need to be humble about the nature of things in the world mm -hmm. outside ourselves, because all we know about them is the effects they have on us. Scientific theories are, in the end, complicated theories about um, which explain the effects that the world has on instruments, and ultimately the instruments have on us. Hmm. So. <laughs> Let's if okay. if things in the world have natures other than causal natures, right, other than the effects they have on other things, then science is not in a position to tell us anything about that. So it's not surprising that sitting here and looking at quarks and looking at books, that you won't learn anything about how, how things are in and of themselves. All you'll ever learn about them is the effects that they have on you. This seems like a, a very beautiful conception of what existing physical phenomena are because if you think about it again maybe this is speaking a lot of my own thought process here if we expand what we mean by physical to include all of the goings on as kind of the explanation for everything then it's remarkable really really remarkable to think that in this world of bits you have the potential for every aspect of our conscious existence. You have people, or what we call people, whatever those are. You have the experience of love. You have all these things that is constructed by whatever the universe is constructed by. That's incredibly uh, powerful if you think about it. Sure, sure. But I guess what it, what I mean, well, I guess what I was trying to use it to to say was, it's not surprising that when you think about things outside the world. Um, they seem so tremendously different from when you think about yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about things in the world, all you're learning is about their effects on yourself. So you're comparing how you are yourself under one circumstance and how you are yourself when you think about quarks, and those two things are going to look a bit different. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell you that quarks are fundamentally different from our quarks, because your quarks are the ones which are your experience. Those quarks out there, they only affect you insofar as they affect your experience. So, of course, they seem very different. doesn't mean that they are. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your time. I've I feel really like enjoyed it. there's so much more. We, we didn't talk about intentionality. Or when you said my quarks versus your quarks, what does that mean? Talking about the quarks that make up my head versus the quarks in that book. Nothing mysterious. But what is the my part? Ah, uh, well, yes. The ones that are here. It's all <laughs> okay. indexicals. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. It's been great. Cheers. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Brad and Mitchell of the University of Sydney. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did, and I can't wait to break this one down. Don't know when I'll get around to it, but it's certainly one on my list to go through. If you're listening to this as a physicalist or as a monist, and you think it's self-evident that there's only one type of existing things in the universe, I urge you, put on your devil's advocate hat. Try your best to articulate and think through these arguments from a non-monist perspective. And if it doesn't make any sense, if you think there's no way to make sense of anything other than monism, you're not trying hard enough. You're not doing it right. The dualists or the pluralists can certainly make sense of the allure and the promise of monism, but if the monists can't make sense of the sensibility and the reasonability, not necessarily the accuracy, of dualism and pluralism, then there's a problem. Unless you can find a logical contradiction, there is no room for immediate dismissal of any of these ideas. So thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great week.